Okay, 2.45 and time to roll. You may remember that last time we were taking our first look at the aggregate supply aggregate demand model and we looked at the structure of the model with no applications. And I reminded you there's some background reading you must do. And also pointed out that after next week and we've completed the loanable funds model, then we have our first examination. So that I, I think then is um, a week from next Tuesday will be our first examination. So we'll start talking about that and I'll have to send out electric bullwhip emails to the people in this class who are watching the videos because I can tell that they're falling way behind as they always do. And so tell your friends if you have any to get caught up on this stuff because if you try to cover it all at the last minute, it's difficult to do and I think that is the operative factor that separates out the A's from everybody else in this class. So this is where we stopped, and that's a good place for us to start. We said certain questions can be answered in the context of the loanable, the aggregate supply aggregate demand model, and this was our list. What causes inflation, or do we have a theory of inflation that can be represented by the model? And when we discover historically that there have been episodes of inflation with recession, which is counterintuitive, can this model explain that? What is the role of inflationary expectations? We're beginning to talk about the robust impact of expectations upon economic behavior. And then more specific issues that are covered in the written chapter, the effects of productivity changes as explained by the model, a discussion of general wage levels in a country, and even a return to a discussion of the pathology of the business cycle. So let's go and take a look at the very first question, the question about inflation, which is also effectively a question about deflation potentially as well. So I've already said this, but I didn't show it in the model. When we were talking about the construction of the aggregate supply curve, we pointed out that if you're watching this on the slides, by the way, what I'm doing here is pointing toward the slide in the classroom, and I have no way to show you on the video slide what it is they're looking at, so I apologize for that. You have to figure that out from context. Um, we looked at the flat part of the aggregate supply curve, and then we saw that it rapidly moves upward. We associated that turning point with some statistics, the one we identified as an example was the capacity utilization rate, and after that, the aggregate supply uh, curve becomes nearly vertical and therefore represents mostly inflation. And so we said at that point that if you're down in here for some reason, you can have very high levels of economic growth that are not inflationary because that's what that flat segment implies. That's the non-inflationary region of the aggregate supply curve. And now we can use this uh, example using the capacity utilization rate. You may recall, going back a few slides here, um, that when we looked at the capacity utilization rate, I have to skip back a few slides to do this. This is the monthly data going from two, uh, 2012, and this was the annual data. We saw this slide last time. That when we approached a level above 85%, that that appeared to be associated with inflationary pressures. So the emphasis the first time we looked at that slide was on this period right through here in the late 1980s on the left side of the graph. But also, we did end up saying at the very end that when you're down through here, of course, and the capacity utilization rate is very level, like a level of 66, 68, 70 or so, then of course that's very low compared to its historical average. And that means that the economy has had a recession, and this represents the trough of that recession, uh, the red line, oh, that's the, actually that's the peak of the business cycle, so the trough is down here that follows, the red is the peak, the trough is uh, not shown, but is going to follow it obviously. And so, of course, we were suggesting that during a recession that this capacity utilization rate plunges to a level that's well below 75 and possibly even closer to 65. And so if that's true, 
then going back to our aggregate supply curve, that means that in the context of the model, the level of aggregate demand, wherever it happened to be when the economy was at the peak, has collapsed back to a relatively low level in the context of this model. And so we can refer to that relatively low level as the demand line labeled AD1. And so basically we're saying here that the economy's recession has been so severe, the capacity utilization rate collapsed back down to 65 and we have a substantial amount of excess capacity in the economy. That means, therefore, if the Federal Reserve System, for example, decides to choose a very stimulating economic policy to try to restore the economy's good health, and it has the effect of radically shifting out the aggregate demand curve, as is shown in this diagram, from 81 to 82, it's likely to be effective, and at the same time, it's not going to cause inflationary problems because you are so far down in the aggregate supply, on the aggregate supply line that you have a great uh, room, uh, a great deal of latitude for an expansion beyond that low level. And so you can have very high levels of growth with no inflation. Now this is one of the reasons why we have to dismiss the suggestion that too much money chasing too few goods causes inflation, because this kind of phenomenon that I've just described a policy run by the Federal Reserve System intentionally to stimulate the economy so it will move from 81 to 82 is of course going to be a policy that shows up in copious growth of the money supply and credit however measured. It's going to show up as very high levels of money supply growth rate, very high levels of credit growth rate, and despite the fact that that data is there, it shows up as absolutely no inflation, of course. And so there's a clear example of how you have to dismiss the simple notion that if you pump the economy with excess credit or money, it's going to cause inflation. In this context, not only does it not cause inflation, we demonstrate that instead we're going to experience price stability. You do get the desired effect, which is a substantial increase in aggregate demand measured in real terms, and therefore GDP measured in real terms. And that is exactly what the policymakers are trying to achieve. So that does mean that if you're able to use robust monetary policy to stimulate demand over, in fact, months, if not years, you can do that and stimulate the economy without causing inflation. So that's a very valuable lesson right there. On the other hand, if you continue to stimulate past the recovery level and as a consequence the capacity utilization rate and similar measures rises back up to what people regard as near full capacity, then your ability to continue to use that kind of policy vanishes, obviously. And so we're suspecting that by the time we get to the point where the aggregate demand curve AD2 is intersecting the aggregate supply curve, that the capacity utilization rate at that point is back up above 80% and beginning to move in the direction of 85%. And so if that were to continue, if the stimulus were to continue, then you may begin to see inflationary pressures. So just in that alone, there's a significant lesson about when you would want to use expansionary monetary policy and maybe when you would want to finally put it to rest. This exact topic will come up over and over again in this class as we go from abstract to very specific about the current U.S. economy because this kind of stimulating policy in the current economy is still robust and effective. And we need to start thinking about the potential long-term effects of the policy. But it's premature to do that now. So we say, uh, well, what if this stimulation that we're describing, and it doesn't have to come from the Federal Reserve System or monetary policy, it can come from any source. If you're a small nation, it might come from a surge in your export trade. It can come from a very aggressive fiscal policy as well, which would involve the U.S. government, if it's the U.S. we're talking about, increasing federal expenditures hugely without paying for them with taxes, 
basically expanding it with a budget deficit that could also cause this shift in aggregate demand. But let's just for the time being uh, restrict it to a discussion of money supply. It's just we're not talking only about that as a possibility. We're just using that as the current example. If you start to stimulate in the way that we've just described in a different context, where it's been a long time since the last recession, which, by the way, is the current context, and if you're running higher capacity utilization rates, which really isn't the case right now, it turns out. We saw that, and that was surprising revelation. It was surprising to me when I noticed how much it had gone down last year, and it continues down. If, nonetheless, we are running higher than we are right now, as we stimulate through that region, as you can plainly see, we're going to start to get very substantial price pressure, and we're going to have relatively fewer gains in real output. And so this might be what happens near the end of an expansion, as we said, in our discussion of the pathology of the business cycle. There's too much heat in the economy. Something is causing aggregate demand to continue to grow. The economy's capacity is reaching full capacity. Remember what I said about the ancient argument between Malthus and Ricardo, you can't grow a bushel of wheat in a flower pot. You expand the economy's capacity for production over time, but you can't do it quickly in a short period of time very easily. So if in a short time you start to stimulate the economy too much, you move into the inflationary region of the supply curve. And if that happens, then that is what we refer to as classical demand pull inflation. All right, And that is typically the cause of inflation in the modern era. But that is not the kind of inflation that we see associated with business recessions, right? That's the kind of inflation that we see that is intuitive associated with a strong economy in terms of real output. It's just getting too strong in terms of the stimulus. Okay, so is the idea of classical demand for inflation, is that demand from people is so high that it well, we're we're not we're just we're saying that anything that stimulates national aggregate demand, whether it's monetary policy, fiscal policy, it could be if we're a smaller exporting nation, uh, a stimulation in our exports. It can be an effect of a moving exchange rate that is moving in our favor if we're an exporting nation, and that's not relevant to the U.S. But it would be maybe even to Great Britain, let alone to certainly China, or to say Japan or the like. Or if, for example, that there was a surge of credit availability to consumers and we consumers, for whatever reason, started to use it could explain this. So we're just saying generically, anything that can cause this shift outward in the aggregate demand curve, if it happens in context where you're already at near full capacity, is going to have inflationary repercussions, even though in the previous example, if we had excess capacity because we've just come out of a recession, the exact same stimulus would have no inflationary impact at all. So the takeaway from all of this is it really, really depends upon context when you discuss this issue. Now we're able to introduce ourselves to a secondary phenomenon, the effect of inflationary expectations. And when you hear discussions of inflation or read about it um, in economic literature, you'll often hear the expression that inflation is undesirable because it has this automatic tendency to get worse past some point. I already said it myself in class of two or three times. When you get inflation levels at five or six percent, they tend to almost automatically go to 10 or 12 percent or higher. And when they go above double digit, then they want to race right up to say 20 percent or 25 percent. And then finally, if you pass some really dangerous threshold, then you have the problem of the Weimar Republic in Germany in the 1920s where it just races out of control or the problem of Venezuela at the current time where it just races out of control. And you begin to literally see inflation rates of in excess of 1,000% per year, 1,000% per month, 1,000% per week, which has actually been seen historically. So the question is, why is it that when inflation becomes a problem when we begin to see inflation that it has this tendency to automatically get worse. 
And that is answered in this explanation offered by the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. It is argued that once we begin to experience inflation, we begin to expect more of it as businesses and consumers, and consequently we change our behavior in such a way that we accelerate our demand for certain types of commodities and services and businesses for certain types of um, business material and the like, in such a way that that itself shifts out more the aggregate demand curve. And so what we're saying here in the context of this graph is this was the starting point of the previous slide. We were stable at a turning point where the capacity utilization rate and other indicators were showing near full capacity. But demand continued and we started to actually experience inflation as is represented by the rise here. And after AD2 on this graph, as we experienced the inflation, we developed rather quickly robust inflationary expectations, changed our behavior as a result of that, accelerating demand even more and causing even worse inflation. So it's the mere effect of the appearance of robust inflationary expectations that is that trigger that makes an inflation a much worse inflation. So this brings up the role for the first time really played by expectations. And if you've read the material in the chapter by now, expectations very strongly stressed in these models. And I asked you to distinguish between rational and adaptive expectations. And this is where these kinds of discussions and this taxonomy begins to matter. Now, adaptive expectations describes the formation of expectations among consumers, potentially, who are relatively uneducated about the way the economy works. And so, uh, such people only begin to have expectations of inflation if they see inflation happening. So they look around, they notice that prices are rising for automobiles, for their rent, for food, for gasoline and the like. And so using social media or using the newspapers or simply in casual conversation with each other, it becomes increasingly apparent to larger numbers of people and more and more of the population that we have an inflationary problem. And of course, once the inflation is well underway, then especially in the modern era with the impact and exaggeration of social media, of course, this tends to spread potentially very rapidly and has a profound and deep effect, sometimes very quickly. When expectations are spread that way, that's, caused, that's called adaptive expectations. There's another class of expectations that tends to be relegated to the area of, say, professional traders like finance traders. Those are people like me and others who are well-educated who tend to think more analytically in terms of models that they've seen and the like. And so they begin to anticipate that inflation might be the consequence of the type of policy they're seeing enacted or even a single policy change that is initiated by the Federal Reserve Board because they understand rationally that this kind of policy in the past has had inflationary consequences. So they form their expectations based upon variables that they see long before the actual um, datum that is to be measured shows up as inflationary and they change their buying behavior accordingly because of the way they think about this. That tends to be referred to as rational expectations and its formation is near instantaneous. Now this division between these two concepts is a valid division. Um, Rational expectations define nearly perfectly the behavior of the finance markets. The finance markets are driven wildly by the formation of rational expectations because the bulk of traders that explain daily trading activity are professionals and many of them are using models. And so they are responding to secondary and tertiary data 
that tries to give them some indicator of what the future has in store, where interest rates are rising, interest rates are falling, what effect those interest rates would have upon this company or that company, whether these sales reports, for example, that come from Tesla can be expanded into a sense of phenomenal growth for that company. And so it's basically like a very large number of really well-paid people trying to guess what all the data means extrapolating from models into what the implications of the data are and then instantaneously acting on it. And of course in the modern day, acting on it through computer models that are designed to record instances of the data and respond directly to the data without human intervention by triggering off trades. And nothing could be faster than that. That could mean that you could have a, a Reuters press release and it can have an impact upon the stock market or the bond market or any of the financial markets within microseconds of the information being released because machine learning programs somewhere are parsing data from, say, Reuters news releases and looking for keyword combinations that give some indication of more strength or less strength, and they uh, trigger trades. For uh, the big index ETFs like the S&P 500 trackers like SPY, instantly. And you get up and read the newspaper in the morning, it's already happened, it's already over. Uh, if you're talking about the behavior of the finance markets. So that's hyper-rational, almost to where there needs to be a third category of expectations, basically what we might think of as machine expectations, programmed expectations into reaction models, um, and the like. But we'll keep it simple in this class and simply say, yeah, the reactionary, the, uh, the rational expectations are super fast. The older traditional uh, expectations adaptive are relatively slow. Now the reason that matters is because what really matters is the speed by which these economic variables respond to new information. And of course the more rational it is, the quicker the speed, the lower the latency. The more traditional it is, then there's a longer response time and it takes a while for things to unfold. It's extremely interesting to me to see the effects of social media upon how this is changing rapidly right now, for example. I'm watching with avid interest and some degree of horror about the way the world through social media is regarding this coronavirus incident, right? It just gets stranger and stranger with each passing day. And I gave you a warning last time that there appears to be this rise of uh, racism against Asian students in particular, globally and to some extent in the United States, because of rumors being spread about the coronavirus through social media. And it is increasingly documented that it has hit high school campuses especially, but also college campuses to some extent. And you know, that's the very negative side of the impact of social media, because social media amplifies bad rumors and misinformation and uh, triggers off reactions that are on a very large scale that are undesirable. And we're seeing this time and time again. Now this is not directly an economic phenomenon yet, but it will be at some point, but it is an example of something that is triggering expectations on a much more compressed time frame than would have been the case had this happened say in the 1970s or 1980s. And uh, this, again, just seems to compress the reaction time on a very large scale of news events and also distorts the appropriate reaction to those events because of the misinformation that seems to be leveraged up so highly by social media. It just doesn't seem it could get any worse and then it just gets worse on the next incident. So economists will actually, I think, have to take a second look at some of these models and how they explain the timing of incidents given the impact of social media style technology to begin with. Anyway, uh, back to this, it should be clear to you that if you have an inflationary problem, it will get worse. Now, you say, but you haven't really provided an example of why we would change our behavior 
you said we would, and it would cause the aggregate demand curve to shift out. But what's an example of that? Well, it's really easy to explain by example. If you're talking about real estate, remember we identified real estate, whether commercial or um, residential, to be the most volatile category of the NIPA accounts. And the only reason it just doesn't whip this economy around savagely is because those two categories have a very low weight in the NIPA accounts. And they're offset hugely by the big, plotting, stable services component, which explains almost 50% of GDP. But nonetheless, they could explain a lot of the business cycle. Well, that's the category that would be most responsive to exactly this argument, because I if you take, well, if you took Econ 104 from me in the past, one of the things I say to college students for generations, right, uh, save up your money just as fast as you can and as soon as you can buy a house. That's the primary message of Econ 104. I start the class with it, I end the class with it. I've been giving that message for literally 40 years. And I've had students from the past say, that's the smartest thing you've ever told me to do. I did that and it really panned out well. Uh, because, again, it's a leverage investment, and the rates of return on that leverage investment, because of the leverage, turn out to be very high over time. Well, suppose, therefore, you were taking this to heart, and you're, you've been working, you've graduated from Harvey Mudd, finally, you got out of this torture chamber, and you're going to work for a little uh, plush, comfortable $250,000 per year job, screwing around doing something unimportant at Google, right? And so you say, okay, uh, I'm set. I've got all this income. But man, do I have high tax rate, tax bracket, because they don't have any deduction for real estate. So you go try to buy your first house or apartment or condo or um, tube. I guess I've been watching YouTube to see where the dynamics of housing are going in Tokyo, because Tokyo always leads everything that happens in the United States. So basically, people are now living in tubes in Tokyo. And uh, if you go to a hotel room, you just check into your tube. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a little, little tube that's uh, kind of square with rounded corners and typically made of plastic. The nicer ones have a nicer material for the texture and the feel, and it's so big, you know. And it's the equivalent of 30 or $40 a night, cheap. And you just crawl into your tube and go to sleep. And then you go eat in a common room, and you use the bathroom in a common room. So, uh, so I don't know what you're going to be buying as your first residence. Maybe it's going to be a tube in Menlo Park <laughs> in a 40-story tube building. And uh, every night you'll uh, climb up a ladder and climb into your tube. And you pay $145,000 for your tube. But just count the money rolling in after that. Your tube will be worth $280,000 in five years, to be sure. So uh, if you're in the home, condo, or tube market in five years then if you were shopping around and you began to notice that inflation was appearing and these prices were starting to rise, especially if you remember that when that happens, interest rates also rise with them, which has a double compounding effect not only on your price for the property you're going to buy, but also upon your rent if you don't buy anything, because your rent's definitely going to go up a lot during an inflationary period, this would cause you to accelerate your purchase of real estate and might make you willing to buy whatever you thought you were going to buy at a higher price so you could avoid buying in the future at an even higher price than that. And so everybody accelerates their real estate demand to get in on the real estate before it drifts away from any possibility of ever buying anything. And that acceleration of demand actually makes the problem worse for a period of time. It exacerbates the rise in real estate prices, compounding them to be even higher, right? And you know that. That's also true if you're trying to buy an expensive car or if you're trying to buy a car where you fear interest rates rising. You say, I want to buy a car, but I don't want to pay you know, 18% for the interest rate on the car. I only want to pay 7% or whatever the current rate is now. You accelerate your demands for cars. So therefore, those categories of GDP that have the highest volatility, which includes not only real estate of both categories, but also consumer durable goods, are the types of commodities that start to really inflate the first. And there you go, right? Even though they have a small weight, 
on overall GDP, they begin to have a higher impact because of the high levels of price inflation. So once that is underway, then it just spreads out to other commodities until we're accelerating our purchases of everything out of fear that we'll have to pay considerably more in the future. Now, the downside of this, by the way, which isn't represented in this lecture, it shows up later in this class, is that if we have deflationary expectations, it has the opposite effect. You say, why buy a house now? It collapses the demand curve, right? The demand curve goes back. Why buy a house now? Let's just wait two years and there'll be 20% less. Or why buy a car now? I hear that Ford's going to have to run discounts on their new Mustang already because they anticipate being unable to sell their production run. So let's wait for that and spend 15% less on the new electric Mustang if that happens, right? And so that has the effect. Those expectations are deflationary expectations, and they have the effect of pushing the aggregate demand curve back and confirming or validating those expectations. So that's why price movement behavior that is extreme is dangerous. Whatever is bad, whether positive as an inflationary impulse or negative as a deflationary impulse, has this automatic tendency to not self-correct, but instead to get worse. Let me stop a second. I thought I brought a bottle of water with me. My throat's getting dry. Uh, you know, I did bring one, but I think it must have rolled off the cart. Well, I'll go a little longer, but I may have to get up and uh, get a sip of water from the fountain out there. Okay, so now we've looked at two things in this model. We've explained why the monetary impact, for example, of inflation depends upon context. It depends on where you're starting. That's the first thing. We've explained the impact of the formation of inflationary expectations on the phenomenon of inflation and why inflation gets worse. Now we can address that question about um, how we can have inflation during a recession. I actually do need to go get a sip of water. Otherwise, I'll lose my voice about halfway through this lecture. So you sit here and meditate on that graph and do a deep ohm breath control thing, and I'll be back, and we'll pick this up. And if you're on video, just hang in there. Go get yourself a cup of coffee or um, get a joint or something like that. I'll be right there. <laughs> Okay. You're all relaxed and calm down. We saw data earlier in the semester when we were looking at the inflationary period, and it showed kind of what's shown here in this really, really old slide from the late 80s, um, that during that inflationary period through the 70s and 80s, this relationship between inflation and the business cycle actually existed, where we had inflation and recession at the same time, which is certainly not characteristic of demand pull inflation, and we had it again in the second so-called double-dip recession. When the economy was uh, troughing, inflation was peaking out. 
And given that demand pull inflation, that explanation we just went through a while ago, has no explanation for that, how do we explain it with the model? Well, remember when we talked about the aggregate supply curve, the role of costs in that plays a significant role. And we said that if there's anything that is raising the cost structure of a business, that has the impact of contracting the aggregate supply curve, as is shown in this graph right here. So we're showing, for example, that if we assume for the moment the aggregate demand curve is stable for the sake of reference, if nothing else, if we have severe cost increases or any kind of severe supply side shock, such as the OPEC oil embargo in the 1970s or 80s, then we would represent that in this model as a contraction backwards or a lifting up, depending on how you interpret it, of the aggregate supply curve as shown here from AS1 to AS2. And given the aggregate demand curve representing at the time, this causes a shift in the equilibrium in this comparative statics model from equilibrium A to equilibrium B. And you can see that the movement along the uh, abscissa reflects recession because you're going to the left on that axis. And the movement along the ordinate is upward, which means that at the same time you're having this recession, you're having inflation. And that's the explanation right there. So you can have, and this is called cost push inflation. And so that means that the two types of uh, the, the inflation we had in those two recessions was referred to as cost push, uh, cost push inflation. It's also called stagflation in the literature, stagnation with inflation. And it is a, of an unusual variety that is fairly rare. You don't see it very often. But when you do see it, it does show up as recession with inflation, which is the worst of all possible worlds. It is a much more common problem in small nations than it is in the United States. But because of the large impact of oil prices and petroleum in particular on this country in the late 1970s and 80s, when OPEC formed the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, formed a cartel to raise oil prices, they increased them about tenfold over where they had been 18 months before. And the shock to the economy was so severe that it actually caused a recession or contributed to a recession and at the same time contributed to an inflation. Now, it's hard to understand how that could be in the modern era because now we aren't quite so reliant upon fossil fuel-based industries we were back in the 70s and 80s. Also back then, we imported all of our fossil fuel products. We did not have any sizable level of oil production. We did have oil production in Texas, Pennsylvania a little bit, mostly Texas and California, but it did not even come close to satisfying national demand. It wasn't even 10% of national demand. Now, of course, because of the impact of fracking, we not only are able almost entirely to provide our oil and natural gas needs domestically, we produce so much that we can export it. If you take a look at the data, you'll see that we have very high imports of oil and natural gas. We also have very high exports of oil and so you say, well, why do you have high imports and exports of oil? Well, it's because it's a regional thing, right? Uh, it's a very regional business. And so you can have the East Coast, for example, importing oil from the Middle East, whereas uh, Texas and the West Coast is exporting oil to, the, uh, to Asia, Japan, and elsewhere. It's a very regional business. Back in the 70s and 80s, though, we were... Uh, dependent upon the rest of the world for our oil supply. And it was mostly oil. It wasn't so much natural gas back in those days. I can remember the impact of it. It's something that anyone who lived through that era can remember. We had to ration gasoline in California for a long period of time to where you could buy gas at the fuel pump only on certain days if your license plate ended with an even number in it because at that time they ended in numbers. And so if your last digit 
was even. You could buy gas on whatever the rule was, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, and if it was odd, you could buy it on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And I don't know what the rule was for Sunday. I don't remember anymore what the actual rule was. And so you could only buy gas on certain days of the week. And I remember that personally because I was in San Francisco during this period of time. And I had to try to drive back to um, Southern California. And I was driving a 1960 Ford Falcon, which actually got reasonably good gas mileage. And gas was expensive then. It was already up to about $1.50 a gallon, which compared to now seems low, but it was only 16 cents a gallon when I was discharged from the Air Force in 1970. You could buy gasoline for 24 cents a gallon at the pump, and 11 cents of that was tax, right? So the actual cost of the gasoline was, well, not even, I guess, 13 cents, right? Uh, 24 minus 13 cents a gallon. And so a couple of years later, we're paid $1.50 a gallon, so that's about a tenfold increase in the price of gasoline, uh, not counting, not taking the tax into consideration. So I was driving desperately to get home on time. I'm pretty sure it was a Sunday. And so I got as far as Santa Barbara, but unfortunately I didn't get to Santa Barbara before midnight. I got to Santa Barbara after midnight, and it turns out that I got to Santa Barbara after midnight on the day then that I could not buy gas. And so there's a little uh, Motel 6 in Santa Barbara near the freeway that every time I drive by it, even to this day, on the way up to Cambria or the Central Coast or something, I remember the time I had to stay in that hotel because for 24 hours <laughs> because I was not able to buy gas until just a little bit after midnight, 24 hours after the time I checked into that hotel. So I was home a day late. So all I did, it was kind of nice, you know, I found a whole bunch of new bars I'd never been to before and went down to the beach the next day and kind of hung out there and found a couple of restaurants, spent 24 hours in Santa Barbara waiting for gas. So this had a big impact upon the economy because it impacted not only fuel costs, but of course petroleum was used heavily in manufacturing, textiles and the like, so it had a big impact. And there were two embargoes. And that's why we had a double dip recession, actually. First embargo raised prices about tenfold. Then the second embargo, about three years later, raised prices another three or fourfold compared to that. Now, uh, this was the impact upon gasoline prices uh, in 1973 and 1979 in the United States. And so the red represents a 12-month moving average. And these are monthly rates, monthly growth rates that are not annualized. So look at the peaks after 73 and 79. So you're seeing um, monthly rates that are increasing at above 6%, or especially in the really bad inflationary period right through here, consistently above 5% per month. And as I say, those are not annualized rates. So, and they're compounding rates, you know. So if you have 12 consecutive 6% increases, then you've got a near doubling of gasoline prices over that period of time. So this had a significant impact upon the economy and at least contributed substantially to the recession at that time and does indeed explain the impact upon prices. So you ask yourself the question, is that relevant ever again likely? Well, first of all, in smaller countries, it's everything. This kind of stagflation is commonplace. It can be caused by exchange rates in a small country because, of course, their import costs can double or triple because of a failing exchange rate or because of a stronger exchange rate, for example. And so when we get to the discussion of exchange rates, they become all important in explaining the economic growth or collapse of small countries because they translate into localized cost push inflation rates if exchange rates are going the wrong direction for you. So for a smaller country, this can be a real problem. For a country as large as, say, China or the United States, it can also be a problem for the more traditional reasons that if you run into supply shortages for labor, for example, you may have cost push inflation arising from rising labor costs. Or if you have natural resource costs that become peculiar, such as water shortages, you can have, uh, regionally at least, cost push pressure from water shortages in a country like the United States. So it's 
possible anywhere for this kind of phenomenon to return. You've never seen any of it in your lifetime if you live in the United States because there hasn't been any such pressure in your lifetime. If you come from overseas, it depends on what country you're from, but maybe you've seen a bit of it there because of um, exchange rate devaluations and revaluations, a topic too advanced to talk about yet in this class. Okay, so we've now got an answer to our third question. How do we explain this? Now, let's get into the general discussion of uh, productivity and the like and the way this affects things. We don't really know what productivity is in terms of defining it all that well. The way you measure it is you take some level of national output, like real GDP, and you divide it into something like the labor force size. And you try to get some sense of how much output you get per unit of labor in an economy. That's one way of doing it. And so, uh, as has been commented multiple times on the productivity measures, they're imperfect because of the assumptions they imply about that application, but nonetheless are good enough for us to say that productivity increases and declines are something that will affect inflation in the long run. Now, if you have significant productivity shifts that are caused by people like you going to work and actually developing technologies that increase productivity, such as the examples I've given you, or it's really obvious if you're talking about robotics, or if you're talking about automated uh, warehouses or the like, or self-driving taxis and the like, all of those things are going to be reflected as productivity increases, and they tend to push aggregate supply curves to the right, as is shown here, because they tend to lower the cost of production of providing any given service. I mean, it's interesting. I know a few people who drive or have driven for Uber and for Lyft, and you get the sense they don't make very much money because it just doesn't come out to a very good number. The price they would have to charge you for the person to make a decent living from it is so high you wouldn't use the service. On the other hand, if you didn't have to pay for the driver, that is going to be very attractive, very popular, and very heavily used. So you know your future is going to be driven around, maybe not even owning your own car, just hopping into a driverless car and using an app to tell it where to go or orally telling it where to go. And away it'll go. And the cost of that is going to be so inexpensive that you can afford to do it and you don't really necessarily need to buy your own car anymore. So we'll see kind of what your generation ends up doing for day-to-day -day transportation, even going to work, whether you own your own cars or whatever. But this technology, without any shadow of a doubt, is going to push the aggregate supply curve to the right, and that tends to combat any and all kinds of inflationary pressures. If nothing else, it will certainly reduce the cost of transportation because it takes out the labor element. At the same time, of course, it eliminates those jobs, and so people who have those jobs have to figure out what else they're going to do. Now, um, rising costs, on the other hand, uh, shift the aggregate supply curve to the left, uh, as is shown um, I don't know why I have that as AS1, AS2. That appears to be backwards. We're saying it's shifting it to the left, so it's going from red to green. And so what we're saying here is that, um, again, with the discussion of the supply curve, it kind of helps if you've seen the microeconomic development of a supply curve logically. But what we're saying is that at any level of output that you're going to find businesses willing to... Uh, provide that output in a rising cost environment, such as represented by the movement from A to B, only if they can sell their product at a higher price, because they have to cover their cost at the margin. And so therefore, if you have a rising cost situation, it's going to push your aggregate supply curve to the left, and that is going to be contractionary. It can be, we've already said, that thing that produces stagflation, which is a combination of inflation and recession at the same time. Now, if you um, introduce at this point in the discussion the question about when are wage increases justified at a national level, let's say, or as a political issue, then 
it's useful to evaluate that question with this model. It kind of depends upon context, but whatever the context happens to be, you can do that. So the first thing we have to say, if this is a national political push of some kind or another, if you elect politicians who say we are going to, by fiat, raise wages so that we can eliminate this problem of the maldistribution of income, and so that will be a possible proposal, then it is going to have the effect, uh, if not offset by something else, of shifting the aggregate supply curve, as is shown there, from AS1 to AS2. It's going to have the effect of shifting it backwards. At the same time, of course, the whole point of raising wages at a national level by fiat decree or, or, or by law is to increase your capacity to buy. And so that will also be shown as an increase in aggregate demand from 81 to 82. That'll be the successful part of the program. So the question is, will any of you be any better off by virtue of this political program? And the answer is, if you not, do not have in place a set of institutions that can encourage productivity gains, the answer is no. It's all an illusion. You won't be better off. You'll have higher wages nominally, but that'll be matched by higher prices. It has been caused by the backward shift in the aggregate supply curve, and your standard of living will not go up. And on top of that, the maldistribution of income will not fix itself. The only way that you can legislate a redistribution of income or to legislate rising wages rather than simply allow the markets to produce them is to ensure that while you're doing it, you have some mechanism that guarantees you have significant productivity gains. Because if you have significant productivity gains through social engineering or private engineering for that matter, then you can pull us off then you can raise in, you can increase uh, wages in nominal terms and they will amount to a wage increase in real terms because the productivity gains you get from using, say, new technology will prevent that aggregate supply curve from shifting back as it's doing in this diagram from AS1 to AS2. And you can have an actual standard of living that's higher and you can potentially have a better distribution of income if this is sort of targeted. So I don't think it a priori one wants to attack sort of general leftist sort of Northern European style ideas simply because they're not going to do any good. There is a high probability that they won't do any good and will be counterproductive if they're not part of a very sophisticated social design that is going to ensure an increase of productivity. But if you have that, those kinds of programs can actually work. At least theoretically, they can work. They're not going to, though, if you don't. Now, that raises this question again. So what is productivity? <laughs> well, uh, it's both difficult to define and to measure. It's meant to imply that if you have a given vector of resources, including labor, to produce a vector of outputs, productivity is said to rise if over time you get proportionally more output for any measure of input over time. If you're speaking only of labor, it's really easy to see. You get more output in real terms per unit of labor if you have productivity gains, or that's the definition of productivity gains in some models. The largest contribution to productivity will be due to the application of technology to production including the production of services. Because in this economy, where we have to have it is on the services side because service is so important. It's pretty easy to do it on the manufacturing side because manufacturing technology just lends itself to better engineering all the time, right? Saving resources here, finding a better way to do it, reducing costs, reducing power usage. That's just part of modern engineering to provide those kinds of solutions. But for services where it's a little more abstract, it may be a bit harder to pull off. But nonetheless, it's going to have to be accomplished. A relevant and commonly used measure of national productivity is uh, GDP per amount of labor time. And uh, many economists use the organization, uh, what OECD, I don't even want to try to remember what that means, annual national accounts for international comparisons. 
and we use a BLS output for our unit labor cost. Now by that, uh, it's kind of strange when you look at it really. Now here, through the 1990s, let's look at the smoothed out moving average, right? Because everything else is too jagged. So we're looking at the movie, the five year moving average of labor productivity, and that's you know, the only thing that really gives us any kind of message. We can see here that clearly through a period that goes uh, for almost 10 years, it was unambiguously rising. And then strangely, after it peaked at about 2004, it fell off. Now, if you look at this from an engineering point of view, or you just say, I'm an engineer, I can explain the rise from 1995 to 2005, but how in the hell do you explain the decline from 2005 up to the present? You know, if it was stable, maybe, that would be a little easier to understand, but this thing actually declines back down. It's very hard to figure out uh, what it is about this economy and our use of technology that caused the productivity measure, per se, to fall back like that. The gains from labor saving technology seems to have evaporated for the time being. And so we're not getting productivity gains now. Now, if you think ahead, though, and you look at robotics and some of the bigger technologies and self-driving vehicles and the like, then one would think that that would show up as an increase, you know, in the next few years of this measure. Because, of course, they're all labor saving to the extreme, especially the self-driving vehicle stuff. So after uh, some sort of technology replaces someone's job, are they still considered in the labor calculation? Because if not, then... Yeah, you count the labor force as just the active labor force. You don't care whether they've changed their job or not, you know, on this. And so usually you could assume uh, in this kind of economy, be, for demographic reasons, it, although there will be a period of difficult adjustment for many people, most people will be able to find new jobs of uh, some kind or another. And if you're talking about uh, more sophisticated economies in terms of labor management, such as the Northern European economies like Finland and Denmark and whatever, where they have active training programs to you know, retrain people to do jobs, then there it shouldn't be a problem at all. Now that doesn't, you don't want to gloss over the difficulty caused by the interim, you know, as you're going from, I just lost my job to, hey, I have a new job. <laughs> if there's a three year period, that's going to be very difficult to live through. And so if you don't have a social support program that makes that more tolerable, then that's too bad. This is why I think maybe uh, that the attraction, especially of your generation of these more, uh, more liberal democratic candidates appeals to you. You kind of get all this, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if you understand anything <laughs> or not, right? But it seems to me why you like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren is because you kind of figured some of this out. It may be that you just think Bernie Sanders is a really cool guy who talks neat. <laughs> I'm not sure about how you think. But, uh, but these can candidates, you know, that sort of, suggest that the transition that has to be adjusted for and helped out uh, are likely, I think, to be candidates that appeal to you more than they would have, say, my generation when I was your age. But who knows? Politics is mystifying to me. So anyway, to the extent that this trend continues, that's bad for anti-inflationary measures. And it's also bad if you're saying we need to raise national income in general in this economy, independent of how it's distributed. It's been stuck for most people for over 20 years. We need to raise that. And that's not going to be non-inflationary unless this number goes up. When you take a look at efforts to estimate services, uh, the data is not, the data is private for that. It's not public. And so you have to rely upon private data. So this is older, this is from the Wall Street Journal. And they're just surveying a private study that they paid for. And so where's the productivity in uh, selected sectors? This is 2014. Well, take a look at this. You've got mining and agriculture, and you say, yeah, mining would be really an area where obviously you can have massive productivity gains, right? You're just talking about designing better and cheaper equipment and the like for mining. Mining and agriculture, the same thing. 
I do follow agricultural technology on YouTube because I find it fascinating. I mean, this is where all the self-driving stuff is really advanced, right? These farms up by Fresno, they have tractors that sit out there driving by themselves for days, leveling fields, uh, using uh, laser-guided uh, lights and whatever to make sure that the field's as level as a pool table, running for 10 miles in one direction and 10 miles in the other. And so the size of them and their productivity gains are really obvious in agriculture. Uh, and then you get down to services <laughs> right here, you know, and you say, oh my God, services is actually negative, no productivity gains. The uh, contribution of labor is actually growing, not shrinking. And that doesn't bode well for this economy in the long run, if that's true. And then when you break it down by services, you say, oh, yeah, now that you think about it, of course it's not. Let's look at this one right here. This one right here is interesting. Called It's called educational services. That would be the service you're currently paying $80,000 a year to take advantage of. Does it strike you that this industry is going through this re remarkable growth of productivity gains for you? And is it resulting in tuition tumbling down to levels that are more affordable? No, no, it doesn't look like anything's changed at any level in this industry for the last 200 years. And uh, there hasn't been so much as a single productivity gain exercised by a single human being anywhere in the entire United States for that entire period of time, which explains why the cost of education just relentlessly defying all other inflationary measures just keeps going up 506% per year while everything else is deflating. And so, but if you look around at the technology and you say, well, whatever even they've got doesn't work, <laughs> and then it's, you know, not improving, uh, duh. Legal service is the same thing, right? You say, oh, man, you get involved in a lawsuit, it'll be just insanely expensive. And so there has to be some technological innovation that's dropping the cost of that. Nope, don't think so. If that ain't going to happen, maybe in your grandkids' lifetimes it'll happen, but not in mine, certainly not in yours. Yeah, I was, told, I was telling my students this morning at Econ 136 that it's time you rioted, right? Because in that, I teach it down there in that basement 60-person room down there, B442 or something. So everybody has to have a laptop in the class because it's a computer modeling class, right? And so every, people spend half the class trying to find a plug. And it's not as though there aren't any plug-ins. Like every single row has a plug-in in the floor, but you open it up, and none of the plugs are connected to anything, right? So they went to design the entire building. It's got 12 Ethernet out uh, ports, one of them is working, <laughs> the other 11 are disconnected, and none of the plugs in the floor are disconnected because you can save 10 cents if you don't put an electrical output in the plug. So you guys can run 35-foot extension lines down the hall into the toilet or whatever it is to get your laptop to work during one of my exams. I don't understand why you're not rioting. Um, so again... This is the ideal situation. If you have wage increases with productivity gains, you have utopia. So actually, you're the solution to the future because you know that really that's effectively, I mean, collectively, the students of this college and others like it, it's your job or will become your job for so many of you to actually be those responsible for these productivity gains. And you'll be the salvation of all of this. The only way that we will ever solve this 90% 90, 90 versus 10% problem is from a solution offered by you. We do have to change the social structure a little bit to make that work, but we can't just change the social structure and make it work without you doing something to contribute to the services sector productivity gains. So I think you've already figured that out. When we take a look at the uh, cost indexes, uh, this is what I use and what the Federal Reserve uses as a measure of the inverse of productivity, which is the effect of labor cost. So if you're not getting productivity gains, this is going up, is what we're saying, right? So this is shown with a two-year moving average. And we showed that in the period uh, right through here that productivity gains were rising, then they bottomed out. Now productivity gains are falling, so uh, the BLS Employment Cost Index, which is basically a measure of what it costs for 
producers to use their labor force, right? This was coming down during the productivity gains, and now the productivity gains were coming down. This is going up. And so this is seen as a key inflationary indicator by the Federal Reserve System. It's not going up at an alarming rate. It's still at a very low level, uh, under 3%, but it's going up compared to what it was in the past, and it's not coming down. So this also reminds us that this um, progress here is mostly technology, and that's why you are going to be those who make a contr contribution to it. A couple more extensions of this, then we'll be done with this for a while. When we talk about the effects of government taxing, spending, and budget deficits, well, as the variables indicated, if you increase taxes upon people in isolation, that has a tendency to pull the aggregate demand curve back, as it shows here. But when the government increases its spending, that has a tendency to push the aggregate demand curve back out, as is shown there. So if you have a balanced budget and you say increase government spending, but you also increase taxes to pay for it, in the context of this model, that's more or less neutral, right? Because the spending is simply being misplaced from the private sector to the government sector. And that may make you unhappy as a taxpayer, but it's not going to have much effect upon GDP. If, on the other hand, you increase government spending and you don't increase taxes, then that stimulates unambiguously. You get to shift out in the aggregate demand curve because that is budget deficit financed government spending. And that can have a stimulating effect that's very strong. And this is the first exposure to this. Now, this, of course, is the temptation of modern politics. You just persistently run really large budget deficits, such as the trillion-dollar budget deficit that we presently undertake in this economy. It definitely has a stimulating effect upon the economy that's long-lasting. It is cheap. Nobody complains about it. You vote people right back into office because they do it. You say, wow, this economy is doing really well. And um, I don't see any side effects of this. Well, there aren't any for you. It's for pr future generations that have to deal with the debt. The side effects are to be held effect. But if you have no children, that's less of a concern. If you do have children, you can just kind of gloss it over and hope that they kind of work it out or something like that. So this is very uh, popular politically. So currently in Washington, even though we're having a critical presidential election coming up, you don't have a soul on any side, right or left, in a hugely divided nation that is willing to talk about the budget deficit at any level. And yet it nonetheless, to an economist like Lee, me, is one of the most profoundly disturbing features of the modern economy because it does have legacy costs that are going to be very high at some point. The reason it's popular is because everybody's happy when you get free cocaine. And so basically more aggregate demand, more real output, no apparent cost. In the credit recession in 2008 to 2010, we had that. And so remember, we did go way back on the, the uh, supply curve to a very low capacity utilization rate because of the mortgage related business recession. It was so serious. And so we knew when we were back there, way down through here, that we could stimulate this economy very strongly and pull it back out of that and not have to worry about inflation. And so that's what we did. U.S. economy in 2020, deficit finance spending. So you just keep pushing it out, pushing it out, pushing it out. And we do have a drift in the aggregate supply curve of about 2% per year because that's what it means when the GDP growth rate in real terms is growing that fast. That kind of means you've got this drift in the aggregate supply curve of about 2% per year, right? And so we have been able to successfully use these budget deficits to help expand this aggregate demand. And the uh, Trump tax cuts for corporate taxes, for example, help uh, produce this current effect, but also left us with a legacy of $1 trillion of new debt every year. So the latter we'll talk about later in the course. We're just conceding right now that this happens because it's politically expedient and popular and for the largest part uncriticized currently in the U.S. economy. 
So we only had a little more than an hour there, and yet we were able to use that hour fruitfully to address a whole bunch of questions and issues with that elementary model. So when we come back on Tuesday, you'll be looking at a new model, the loanable funds model, where we fit, uh, switch to the financial side of the economy. And that also requires you to read a chapter about that. Now, don't fall behind on this reading at this point, because it's very hard to make all of this up if you're postponing listening to the lectures. I'm obviously talking to people on the video and uh, postponing reading the material. There's a lot of stuff in that reading material that I'm not covering here in the lecture, so get caught up on that, okay? And aside from that, we will see you on Tuesday. And enjoy the fruits of your deficit spending and organize riots around the lack of floor sockets in Harvey Mudd College. Those two things are your homework assignment for the weekend.